Good morning, welcome to our first uh, video on Unit 5. We're still talking about applications of the derivative, but now we're moving on to PVA, position, velocity, and acceleration. And uh, the next two will be over related rates and optimization. And then that's it for Unit 5. Okay, um, today you're going to be using derivatives to solve problems including position, velocity, uh, speed, and acceleration. And what we're going to notice is that this is the same relationship between what we've seen before. What we learned before was F, F prime, and F double prime. So I broke it down for you. Position is our function, velocity is our first derivative, and acceleration is our second derivative. Ooh, got a typo in there. Excel, acceleration. I don't even know what I wrote. All right, so let's talk about it. So the first thing we've got is our position function, and this is um, written as S of T. It can also be written as um, X of T as well. So just a reminder, our position can also be written as X of T. So these are our two variables for position. You won't see it as P of T, which is a common misconception. So please make sure you recognize that. Position is our S of T and X of T. And what does that tell us? It tells us about the uh, position of a particle or object or whatever with relationship to the origin with respect to time, so of t, right? So our, our variable is time. We are always with respect to time with these particle, um, particle movement questions. We also have velocity, which is our f prime, as you can see up here. This is the second derivative. So it is represented as v of t velocity, but it could also be represented as s prime and of course x prime. Went a little too far. Um, this tells us about the relationship between velocity with respect to time, but what this also tells us is everything that we understand about the relationship between f and f prime can be applied here. So if we're talking about a max and a min, for example, the highest point and the lowest point of a position, then we can identify that using our first derivative test. If we're talking about where something is increasing or decreasing, uh, for example, is a particle's position moving to the right or to the left, up or down, et cetera, we can also use that relationship between F and F prime. So we know that a position, a particle is moving to the left or down if velocity is negative, if it is below the x-axis. And what does that relate to on my function? If my function itself was decreasing. Look at that, same relationships that we did last time, same things between F and F prime. Now, a particle is moving to the right or up if velocity is above the x-axis, if my original function is increasing. And finally, the last concept would be if velocity, um, if, a fun, if, if a particle is standing still, then velocity is zero. And what do we know what's happening at those points? Well, those are our, typically our extrema points, a max or a min. Not necessarily absolute, but it could at least be a local max or a local min. And finally, we have acceleration. This is our second derivative. Um, our notation is up here as well. You can see clearly that acceleration is a of t which is same as V prime, which is also the same as S double prime. So this is our second derivative. And this, of course, tells us um, how fast a velocity is changing. That's what acceleration is, is the change in velocity. Um, and the biggest thing that we do use with acceleration is that word speed. Now, everybody assumes that speed is velocity. And it's not quite velocity. Speed is a relationship between velocity and acceleration. So you have to understand both in order to recognize speed. So speed will always increase if both velocity and acceleration have the same side. So if velocity is increasing and accelerate, and it's above the x-axis, basically is what's happening with the graph, would mean that they are increasing. So same with if velocity is decreasing and we are below the x-axis, and that would mean uh, acceleration is negative as well, then that is a also, also an increase, so same signs. Now, if we have opposite signs, then that is speed decreasing. And the best way I can explain that to you conceptually is think about a car. So a car can be driving at 60 miles per hour, right? Do we ever say a car is going negative 60 miles per hour? No, but what we could say is the car is going 60 miles per hour east or the car is going 60 miles per hour west. So then positive negative is actually our direction. A negative 60 mile per hour um, is probably west. I don't know. Sometimes I get my directions confused. But um, so positive negative just simply tells me which direction I'm going. But the car is still going 60 miles per hour. So imagine if a car is going 60 miles per hour, whether it's in the positive or negative direction. And if I apply 
a force in the same direction, then what's going to happen to that car? It's going to increase. So that's the same sign, same force applied. So that acceleration is that force. Now what happens if a car is going 60 miles per hour, whether it's in the positive or negative? And my, my force comes from the opposite direction. So the opposite sign, whether it's a negative 60 miles per hour or positive 60 miles per hour, it doesn't matter as long as my force is the opposite sign. Well, then what's going to happen with that car? You are meeting a resistance. So of course your speed is going to decrease. So it's the easiest way I can help you realize the relationship. What is speed? Speed is a relationship between velocity and acceleration. Okay, so let's actually start with a couple of examples. I've got some algebraic examples and some graphical examples for us to analyze. And the same way we analyzed FF prime, F double prime, we're going to approach our PVA. But to begin, I have this example of a dynamite blast launching a rock, yada, 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 and how high does the rock go? So how would we have solved this with pre-cal? Well, we might have graphed it, whether we graphed it by hand or a graphing calculator, it doesn't matter. If you're following with a calculator, I've given you a window to get a similar graph as mine. And we would have looked for a max point, right? What is the highest the rock's going to go? That's my max. 5 comma 400. Well, 5 is my x, which is my independent variable, which of course we know with this relationship is time. So at 5 seconds, my height is 400. I don't know what my unit was. Feet? Feet. And so we realize that the rock has reached that maximum height, but that's the pre-cal. What happens if we don't have that graph? What happens if we don't have information about the original function at all? Well, how would we solve that? So of course, we're gonna go back to the calculus. So it's asking for the height of the rock. And so what does that mean? How high? That means we are looking for a max point. And what do we know about max? This is the first derivative test. And now we've learned about a relationship, PVA, Sorry, P, V, A, that's F, F prime, F double prime. So my first derivative test, we're talking about the velocity. So if we think about it, if we go ahead and take the derivative of our function right here, we get 160 minus 32 ah, T. And if we wanted to know how high the rock goes, then we're looking for a max point. That means the first thing I have to do is find the critical value. So that's where S prime, my first derivative, equals zero. So I solve for that, and we end up solving for t equals five. Hey, that looks familiar, doesn't it? In our previous example, when we, or in our previous slide, when we looked at the pre-cal, we knew that t equals five because we found it at that max point. Well, look at this. But of course, because I'm a good calculus student, I'm going to self-check with a sign chart. So that's, ah, sorry, that's not, that's s prime. And so I put 5 down. I'm going to test my value. Let me change the color so we know we're testing a value. So I'm going to test 0, and I'm going to test 6. So if I plug 0 into this equation right here, we end up with positive. And if I plug 6, uh, 32 times 6 is, far, is larger than 160, so we end up with a negative value. So now I know that my graph from negative infinity to 5 if I sketch that out from negative infinity to 5, is increasing. I don't know where, but I know it's increasing. And then from 5 to positive infinity, I know that it is decreasing. And I don't know 100% where it's above and below the x-axis, but I know it's increasing, decreasing. So I know I have identified a max at t equals 5. So if I know there's a max at t equals 5, all I have to do is plug that information back in. But which one do I plug it back into? Do I plug it into s of t or v of t, which I now know is s prime. So to find out the height, would I plug it into position or would I plug it into velocity? That's what you're asking yourself. Well, I'm hoping that you realize that you would plug it into the position to identify height. So then we understand s of 5. So that becomes 160 times 5 minus 16 times 25, which we end up with 400 feet. And that was the same answer. But of course, I just you did the calculus solve, which is what we are working towards. So to wrap up, there was my great idea to use our relationship between FF prime and F double prime. So to wrap up, let's actually look at that graphically. So to remind ourselves about the calculus, to remind ourselves to use that derivative, what is the slope of my curve at this maximum point? Well, we know that the slope is zero, but how do we know that that slope is zero? Because when I look at that graph, I can see that there is visibly a horizontal tangent line. Look at that. If I connect at a tangent line, which, is mean I'm, which means I'm connecting at exactly one point, 
then I would create a horizontal tangent line. And horizontal lines we know are constants. So derivative of a constant is zero, therefore slope is a constant. Slope is zero. Okay. So now, same same question: How high does the rock go? Show your calculus. Blah blah blah. We already did that. I was a slide ahead. So here was that same answer. We took the derivative. We set that derivative equal to zero because that's our critical point. We tested that critical point, realized it was a true max, and then found that t equals 5 at that max, so we plugged that back into the correct equation. And for this, it was asking how high, so the correct equation was my position. The second question asks us, what is the velocity and speed of the rock when it is 256 feet above the ground, on the way up and on the way down? Ooh, well, of course, pre-cal would say, look at your graph. Pre-cal would say, identify the quadratic information using 256, but we're not in pre-cal anymore, we're in calculus. So what I need to know is that we're looking for the velocity, and of course it's asking about speed, so this isn't velocity, this is the relationship between speed, or sorry, between velocity and acceleration. So this means that I'm actually going to have to also look at acceleration in order to under understand the speed. So might as well start with some sign charts, so I'm going to need the S prime sign chart, and we've already done that, so that makes it nice and easy. What was this? Negative, no, positive, negative, okay. I also know that S prime was equal to 160 minus 16T, so I'm going to go ahead and write that. Well, let's go ahead and do our acceleration. So this is S double prime, which is my acceleration. I'll go ahead and say this is my velocity. And if I took that derivative, ah, the 160 is going to disappear. All I'm left with is negative 16. So that's it. That's all I can know. There is no sign chart because if I said that a of t was equal to negative 16 and I set that equal to zero to see if there's a possible inflection point, well, that wouldn't work out. So that's why I know that I don't really need a sign chart for that. All I need to know is that my acceleration is equal to negative 16, and it is always going to be equal to negative 16. Uh, what is my relationship? Feet per second squared. So I know that because that's all I've got there. Now, if there had been a variable, I could have plugged in. I could have dealt with it. I could have found a sign chart. So let's analyze our information. When it is 256 feet above the ground, then I'm going to need to actually figure out what time is when it is 256 feet above the ground. So I would take a moment to solve for that with my position graph. So I would set 256 is equal to 160t minus 16t squared. And I end up solving and I end up getting 2 and 8. So thinking about 2 and 8, there's two different answers. Well, which one is on the way up and which one is on the way down? Well, how would I know when it's on the way up? In order to know position, I need velocity. So if velocity is positive, then it's either moving to the right or it's moving up. And look at this right here. We have velocity being positive. When What is t in that? Is t2 or is t8 in that interval? Well, this interval is from negative infinity to 5, so the only one is t equals 2. So then this one is 5 to positive infinity. Looking over here, that's t equals 8. So on the way up was at t equals 2. On the way down was at t equals 8. And I used my relationship between f, f prime, f double prime. I'm going to go ahead and speed things up for the rest of this video, so we're going to move on. So when would the rock hit the ground? The rock would hit the ground when t equals 0, right? Well, we can assume that t started at 0 because they didn't give us an initial start position. We can assume that t started at 0 as well. Um, so I would just solve for t equaling 0 or sorry, my position equaling zero. And so here's that information. So zero would equal 160t minus minus 16t squared. And you solve, and you get zero and 10. So zero is probably our starting position. 10 is probably our ending position. How would I test that? Um, I could test that by figuring out uh, the relationship between my position, velocity, acceleration. We could do some some maneuvering. Um, we could also look at our graph. Like there's a couple different ways we could see that. So what about average velocity? Okay, average velocity. When we move on to our second semester, we'll actually have an equation for this using integration, which is the 
opposite of a derivative, not quite, but it's the opposite of a derivative. But so for today, we're actually going to use the formula for average velocity using the concept of what is the average rate of change with relationship to our instantaneous rate of change. Our average rate of change is you know, an estimation of the derivative. Our instantaneous is the derivative. It's at that single tangent point. But if I'm looking for average velocity, I'm going to go ahead and use this A rock formula. So I plugged it in. There's my information. That's my answer. We have a second example, and this one says find the position of the particle at two seconds. That's my first question. We are given position again. That's our example. Uh, that's in the given. We're given our positions function, our positions equation, and we're asked to find the position at two seconds. So I'm told t equals two, and I need to find the position. Well, that's as simple as plugging in s of two, which when we plugged it in, we solve for negative one. But what is the meaning of this answer? This means that the value of the, 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 the this value means that the particle is four units left of where it started. Okay. Find the average velocity, again, using that same formula. Um, well, I didn't write the formula this time, but it should have been S of 4 minus S of 0 all over 4 minus 0, uh, which you end up with like 3 minus 3 over 4 minus 0, which is 0 divided by 4, which got us 0 meters per second. That's where that came from. The instantaneous velocity. So here's the question I first wanted to get to. So in the previous ones, we did the average rate of change. We know that formula, f of b minus f of a, all over b minus a. But what is the instantaneous? We know this is the derivative, so that's all we need to do. To find the instantaneous velocity, then I need s prime. So that's 2t minus 4. And when t equals 4, so that's not just s prime, that's s prime of 4. So that becomes 8 minus 4, which is Four. And of course, I need a unit, which is meters per second. So here that is wrapped up in a nice, neat formula for you. Now we need to find the acceleration of the particle. So velocity was S prime. So then acceleration has to be S double prime. So I take a moment to figure that out. S prime was 2t minus 4. So S double prime is simply 2. There's no more variable. So this is the acceleration everywhere. Whether t equals 4 or not, my acceleration is 2 meters per second squared. What values does t, the, for what values of t does the particle change direction? Well, how do I know a change in direction? Directionality is not determined by a position's function. It's determined by velocity. To recall, if velocity is positive, the particle is moving to the right or up. If velocity is negative, the particle is moving to the left or down. If velocity is zero, the particle is standing still. So that's just a recall about directionality and velocity. So I take a moment to find my velocity. And I need to know when it is changing direction. You think I need a sign chart? You're right. I do need a sign chart. So I'm going to take a moment to find my critical value, 2t minus 4 equals 0, because the critical values are found when f prime equals 0. So I move that 4 over, and I divide by 2, and t is equal to 2. I only have one po uh, critical value, so now I test to see what it is, what's happening on either side. So I'm going to test, let's test 0 and 3. Uh, if I plug 0 into this, that becomes negative. 3, 6, six minus 4 is positive. Okay, so now I know that right here, my velocity, this is S prime, which is V of T. Now I know that my velocity is negative. This means that it was decreasing. This means that it is going either down or to the left. Here, my, my position is increasing. My velocity is positive, which means it's going up or to the right. So this is a true change in direction. And that would be my justification, would be a good sentence. And here is my sentence. At t equals 2, the particle changes direction because s prime, which is the velocity, but s prime goes from decreasing to increasing. And I even wrote what decreasing and increasing were. Now let's move on to some graphical examples. So a particle P moves along a horizontal line. The graph shows its position as a function of time T. When is P moving to the left? And explain. So now we have to start by looking at our question and explaining it. Wrong. Just like last time. We're not ever going to start with the question. We're going to reread 
what it told me so I can figure out what graph they've actually given me. So again, I've highlighted it for you, but I need you to take a moment and think about this in terms of this being the graph of position. What do we know that is? That's our function. That's the original. That's not the first derivative. That's not the second derivative. So make sure you recognize that. So when is P moving to the left? Well, what do I know about directionality? I usually know about velocity. So if velocity is negative, then my particle is moving to the left or technically down. Well, how would I know velocity is negative? Where is the function decreasing? That's what makes velocity negative. That's what makes the second or the first derivative negative. Where is it decreasing? So I look at my graph and I see that it is, is decreasing from 0 to 2 and 7 to 9. So that is where the graph, is, the, sorry, P is moving. He is moving to the left from 0 to 2 and 7 to 9. What about where it's standing still? Again, how do I know about direction? I know about it in velocity. Standing still is when velocity equals 0. Well, how do I know velocity equaling 0? That's not an increase on my function. That's not a decrease on my function. That's when my function is constant. So I look for any constant points, and my constant points occur from 5 to, what is that, 7 and 9 to 12. Okay, and again, I know that a graph is, or my, my position is constant. That means velocity must have been zero at those points. When is the first time that P reverses direction? Again, we are looking at direction is velocity. So a change in direction would be velocity going from negative to positive or positive to negative, which means it would be going from an increase to a decrease or a decrease to an increase. Where do I see that happening? Right here, I see a decrease or decreasing function going to an increasing function. So that would be our first time that P reverses direction would be at T equals 2. Technically, there's also a reverse of direction ish at seven. We went from an increasing graph and we stood still for a second, but then we decreased. So we were going to the right. We might have stood still, but then we went and moved to the left. So there's one occurring at seven and uh, what is that? At 12. So those are also there if you're looking for the other reverse in directions. When would P move at its greatest speed? Speed is not velocity. Speed is the relationship between velocity and acceleration. And what do I have to know for it to Ooh, I lied. If it was asking if it was speed increasing or decreasing, then we are looking for that relationship. I need to reread my question. It's asking for it moving at the greatest speed. The greatest speed would be my velocity's highest point or lowest point. It doesn't have to be just the highest point because remember, speed when it's positive, negative, that's not my speed. A car isn't going negative 60 miles per hour. A car is going 60 miles per hour in the negative direction, whether that's back or left or whatever. Oh, my gosh, I feel sick. Sorry. Whether it's back or left or wherever, speed doesn't move positive or negative, uh, so it's not negative 60 miles per hour. So what I'm looking for is where velocity is at its highest and its lowest. Well, where would velocity be at its highest and its lowest? Well, that would be the highest slope, right? The greatest slope, the steepest slope. So whether it's positive or negative doesn't matter. We have a pretty steep slope right here. But if I look at this slope right here, isn't that crazy sleep? steep? Wouldn't that be my largest slope size? It doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. So our greatest speed actually occurs at our steepest uh, interval. And so that was from seven to nine. If I took a moment to actually calculate that slope, that is a slope of negative four, whereas my slope from two to five is only a slope of Oh, wait, is that also a slope of four? Nope, four, four thirds. So you can kind of see the difference there. I didn't even do my slope correct. But if you took the slope of every single line, every single linear line, then you would realize what its greatest speed was. So even though negative seven, or sorry, the interval from seven to nine has a slope of negative four, again, speed's negativity doesn't matter about the value. That's still a speed of four, but the negative simply tells me which direction I'm going in.
Now we have another example, example 2a. We have a particle moving along and it's asking us when p is moving to the left. So should I start here? Heck no, I reread my question to take a moment to realize which graph was given to me. And I even highlighted that for you. This is now the graph of velocity, which means this is now the graph of the first derivative. So we have to treat it as such. So if this is the graph of the first derivative, then these are no longer telling me my max mins. This is my velocities graph, which means this is um, if it's above the x-axis, then it was increasing in my position. If it's below the x-axis, it's decreasing for s of t. If it's at a zero point, this is potentially a max or min. Like that's, that's kind of how we have to read this now. This is now the graph of the second derivative. So when would p be moving to the left? Well, of course, directionality is given to me by velocity. Guess what? This is the graph of velocity, so we got lucky. For it to move to the left, velocity has to be negative. So where is this graph negative? Where is it below the x-axis? That's what you're asking yourself. So it's from approximately 8.3 8 to what, 13 and a half? This is where it's below the x-axis. So where would it be standing still? If it was moving to the right, it would be above the x-axis. If it was moving to the left, it would be below the x-axis. So where would it be standing still? You're right. That point between above and below the x-axis which is your zero point. So where does it hit the x-axis? Where does it intercept the x-axis? That's at approximately eight and a half or 8.3 and 13 and a half. When is the first time that P reverses direction? Again, if it's above the x-axis, because this is the graph of velocity, that's where it's moving to the right, below it's moving to the left. So the first time I see it go from above to below or below to above is at 8.3. Greatest speed. So in the previous question, greatest speed, we were given the graph of position. So greatest speed was associated with the greatest slope. Greatest speed on this graph is literally the max or min point for this for the velocity graph. So what's my highest point over here? This is where velocity equals 5. This is where velocity equals negative 3. If I took the absolute value of those, then 5 is actually my answer. So its greatest speed is occurring from 5 to 7 on my interval because that's where the greatest um the greatest point is. And if you need me to highlight that really quick, because I've got a white pen, it's not showing up. But if I highlighted that spot, that would be right up here. When does P speed up? Ah, so here is that question. When we're talking about an increase in speed, an increase in speed, then my velocity and acceleration have to have the same sign. It doesn't matter whether they're positive or negative, they just have to have the same sign. So if this is the graph of velocity, then everything above everything above this line means velocity is positive. Everything below this line means velocity is negative. But what about the relationship, not of velocity, but now of acceleration? So I'm gonna take a moment to write out all of my acceleration concepts. So right here, my acceleration is negative. And how do I know that? Because my graph is decreasing. So its derivative better be negative. So here acceleration is negative. This is increasing. So acceleration is positive. This is constant. Acceleration is zero. Right here it is negative. It is still negative right here. This is constant. This is positive, And this is positive. How does that help us? Well, if we're looking for speed, we're looking for the same, same sign. So up here above the x-axis, I need to look for anything positive. Right here I have a positive, and right here I have a positive. Below the x-axis, I need to look for anything with a negative acceleration. So those are our three intervals where we're speeding up, and let's verify that. From two to five, that's the first interval. From eight and a half, eight point three to nine, and from 13 and a half to 15, because velocity was either positive when acceleration was positive or velocity was negative when acceleration was negative. And so this was above the x-axis, increasing. This was below the x-axis, decreasing. That's how we figured that out. So of course, slowing down would be the opposite. So where was it above the x-axis and decreasing? Where was it below the x-axis and increasing? Well, right here and above and decreasing and below and increasing. And those would be our three intervals. And look at that, same answers.
So a little bit of closure. I know, finally, it was a little bit of a long video. I'm sorry about that. But a little bit of closure. Here's a graphical representation. We haven't learned this concept of integration. However, you can kind of see a relationship between that car, our position, our velocity, acceleration, that visual representation of what's happening. But to make our lives even easier, I've copied and pasted a couple different cheat sheets that I found online that just kind of tell you what you would see in a word problem and what you're actually doing. So when you see this, think this mathematically. Here's another one with some of the same information and some better information. So when you see this, think this. Now, some of these concepts we haven't learned. For example, we don't know what this equation means yet. We don't know what this equation and this equation and this. We don't understand those yet. And that's okay. But this is just a general overview for you. All right. And I'll see y'all in class.